We've just listened to one of the historical accounts of what Easter Day is actually about, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's an event that has changed the world in more ways than most of us are likely to realise. We're all experiencing a world that has been dramatically changed by a little virus. The world today is not the same as the world just a few weeks ago. Some indeed are asking whether it will ever be the same again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is like that, except that the changes to human lives and to the world have all been good. But the world is not the same today as it would have been if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead. And for, that, for those who know this, life is not the same as it would have been if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead. And it's important to say that death is not the same as it would have been if Jesus Christ had not risen from the dead. This Easter morning, I want to invite you to listen to this account carefully with me for a few moments and think about three things that we learn about why the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead matters. The first is simple but very important. It's because it happened. Follow with me from the beginning of Matthew chapter 28 again. Matthew chapter 28 verse 1. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb where Jesus' embalmed body had been laid to rest after his execution on the Friday. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards, these were the Roman soldiers who'd been placed there by the authorities to ensure that no one stole the body of Jesus. The guards were so afraid of the angel that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. We won't think about all the details, but will you notice three facts? Fact number one. While the event we read about here is clearly in the abnormal category, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree with me about that, what we know about it comes from eyewitnesses. The two women mentioned here are the beginning of a long list of eyewitnesses from whom the New Testament accounts of the resurrection of Jesus derive their fundamental credibility. There were more than 500 such witnesses who could be called to testify to having seen what they did not expect to see, having heard what they did not expect to hear. Jesus himself alive again after his execution a couple of days earlier, visible audible, touchable. When the message about Jesus' resurrection began to be proclaimed by these witnesses in a movement that would change the world, 
they would say, we are witnesses of these things. And they meant it literally. And when they said, we are witnesses of these things, either they were lying or they were deluded or they were telling the truth. And there is no evidence whatsoever to suggest that they were lying or deluded. And a whole lot that vindicates their testimony. You see, it's the witnesses that tell us that it happened. Fact number two, the tomb was empty. These women were not the only witnesses to the fact of the empty tomb. The simple fact is that if the tomb still contained the body of Jesus, it would have been simple enough for the opponents of the new Christian movement, and there were plenty of them, and they had power, and they had resources. It would have been simple enough for them to have produced the body and put, to an, put an end to all this nonsense as they saw it there and then. So there is... You see, the positive testimony to the empty tomb from those who found it empty and saw the place where the body of Jesus had been laid with their own eyes, supported by the negative evidence from those who had an interest in disproving the point and a whole lot to gain by simply pointing to the body in the tomb, which they never did. Now, of course, the fact that Jesus' body was placed in a rock tomb on the Friday afternoon and then the tomb was empty on the Sunday morning does not itself prove the resurrection. There may be several explanations for the tomb being found empty, but one explanation is certainly that he had actually risen from the dead. And empty the tomb certainly was. Fact number three, Jesus himself was seen and heard and touched. Again, we have before us only part of the evidence, only some of the witnesses. But it was not the case that the eyewitnesses came and found and saw the empty tomb and then came up with the idea of the resurrection as an explanation. No, no, no. Jesus himself was seen and heard and touched. Those who saw him were, of course, deeply moved by their experience, but they were not mad and they were certainly not liars. And we have the record of their testimony. You see, we know about the resurrection of Jesus Christ in exactly the same way that we know about other events in the world. Yes, this event is unusual. So you might ask for stronger testimony than usual to convince you that it happened. And that is exactly what we have. The testimony of eyewitnesses is the basis for the record that we read here in Matthew chapter 28 and the other accounts in the New Testament. You see, the first reason to take notice of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is because it happened. Second reason, because denials that it happened are lies. Like this one, follow the account from verse 11 in Matthew chapter 28, verse 11. While the women were on their way, Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has widely circulated among the Jews to this day. That, of course, is the day that Matthew was writing this account. 
There have been many desperate attempts to deny the fact of Jesus' resurrection. This is just one of the earliest. It's worth noticing, however, that at this early stage, a story had to be devised that would account for the tomb being empty. That was apparently undeniable. Modern lies have the luxury of not always having to deal with that fact. You can ignore the empty tomb if you wish, if you choose to, and no one can directly contradict you today, but that does not make the lies any more credible. Here's the original lie. You see it in verse 13. His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. A lie based on the testimony of those who claim to have been asleep at the time. You can think about that. But there have been many lies like this one. One of the most popular over the years has been that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just lost consciousness and was taken for dead. But once he was laid in the tomb, in the cool of the tomb, the fact of his body being embalmed is usually overlooked. But once he was laid there in the tomb, he revived and he rolled away the rock that sealed the tomb. He overcame the guards that had been posted at the entrance of the tomb and he escaped to convince his disciples that he had conquered death and he was the Lord of the universe. And people who believe that tend to think that Christians are the gullible ones. I leave you to work that one out. There is not one shred of evidence for any of that theory. The story is as deceitful as the one that the guards were bribed to tell. I don't know about you, but I do not like being told lies, especially about something important. And if lies are being told about the resurrection of Jesus, we ought to recognise that that is nothing new and they are no more credible today than ever, no matter who is telling them. And it is all the more reason to listen carefully to those who were there and are credible witnesses. A third reason for taking notice of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, this, because it is enormously important. From verse 16 of Matthew chapter 28. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is almost always underestimated, even by Christian people. The resurrection of Jesus is not, is not just the greatest miracle of all time that proves that God is there. That's true, but it still misses the point. The Bible's message is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead was the beginning of a new era in the history of creation. It had been long anticipated through the pages of the Old Testament and it is the era in which God's perfect rule over this troubled world has begun to take effect. Jesus called this the kingdom of God. Jesus' own explanation, you see, of the significance of his resurrection is this, all Authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ, you see, is not just an extraordinary event. It was about who rules the universe. The king has begun to reign and he has demonstrated his authority and power even over death by rising from death. Death could not hold him. And he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. With the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the time has now come for people in every nation to be called into the kingdom of God, to recognize and welcome the authority of Jesus Christ, the King, over all things, including my life and my death. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he said. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He is the Lord of the universe. He's my Lord. And what this life holds for me is in his hands. And yes, the present crisis is in his hands. It really is. And bigger than that, what lies ahead for each one of us and for the whole world for all eternity is also in his good and powerful and wise and righteous hands. And friends, that is good to know. This Easter day, can I urge you not to run away from the big question of life, which is, what will you do with Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead. He calls you to be his disciple, which means to learn from him, to learn to trust him, to learn to love him, to learn to obey him. And your answer is either yes or No, I have better things to do. Really? I'd like to lead us in a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We thank you for this demonstration of his power, and his authority. And we pray that each one of us listening to these words this morning will be or become or delight more fully in being his disciple. We pray that you'd help us to learn from Jesus Christ to learn to trust him, to learn to love him, to learn to live for him. We thank you that knowing that he is Lord, that all authority has been given to him, we know that the things that we are anxious about this day, the things that are fearful to us, the things that make us unsettled, All these things are in his hands. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, that we might learn to know that and we might learn to enjoy the peace, the contentment, the joy that comes from knowing Jesus Christ as our own Lord. We pray for these things in Jesus' name.
Amen.